Hey everybody, so you may have noticed I've been posting these things up called Partimento Realizations. What is a Partimento? And what is a Partimento Realization? So the best way of putting it is, uh, as a scholar Robert Gerdingen sort of described, it's basically the sort of Baroque stroke classical version of a, um, of a chord chart, of a lead sheet. Um, and you have a bass and you have some numbers above the bass on the simpler ones, although later on the numbers disappear, um, which tell you uh, which chords to put over the bass. And it's up to you to come up with a piece of music. That's a long and the short of it, really. So one of the big collections of these things is uh, Fenaroli's, uh, I think, six books, if I remember correctly, um, which go from simple figured basses to partimento fugues. So the idea is you start off, you know, composing sweet little arias and preludes on a fairly simple basis and by the end of it you're you're basically coming up with fugues um, in you know various numbers of parts while it's not necessarily how to improvise or how to compose you can use it either to improvise or compose it, it is um, a vehicle for for classical improvisation which doesn't rely on stuff like for instance um, ground bass so you know i've done quite a lot of stuff in ground bass over the years my project balagan cafe band for instance we used to play we used to improvise still do if we ever have any gigs uh, we, we uh improvise over chacons and stuff like this um partimento uh introduces some more complex forms and if you look at feneroli he's kind of taking various figures and putting them in different keys and you know suggesting places where you might want to do imitative counterpoint and stuff like this and then that eventually leads you towards fugue um, when, when you've gone through all of this stuff. Um, so uh, obviously the attraction as a jazz musician is like, oh, this relates to something I know. And I've always been a bit obsessed with classical improvisation ever since I read about these famous stories about Bach, for instance, uh, improvising six part fugues at the court of Frederick the Great and then Frederick the Great going like, oh, I'm going to give you a nasty, a nasty, nasty subject and see what you can do with that. And he got his music guy to write him this crazy fugue subject. And Bach was like, okay. And then went away home and then came back with the musical offering, you know, which is, um, uh, you know, great, great story. Or, or, or the great lutenist Silvius and Leopold Weiss, you know, having a, an improvisational contest with Bach. I mean, you've got to be pretty confident if you're going to do that. That's all I'm going to say. It's like going up against, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> with with your loop I, I know they had eight million strings or whatever but um <laughs> that is a uh that, that that is a um an optimistic move but apparently bach came away from the day saying oh something special in the way of music occurred today so um obviously he was quite impressed and i do love weiss's music um as well as bach's so this this is the kind of background of course mozart's well known as an improviser um but also, you know, all of the composers that we've now more or less forgotten about, people like Paisiello, Durante, people like that, who were famous like composers in their own day, wildly successful. Probably the best one we know of who isn't Mozart is Salieri, just because, um, you know, Peter Schaffer did the hatchet job in Amadeus. <laughs> Salieri was a good guy. Um, he was. He was a good friend to Mozart. Anyway, um, so, um, and he also taught Schubert as well, which I only found out about recently. Anyway, um, so this was uh, the kind of world of 18th century music and um, a partimento uh, and, and the teachings, um, partimento is just one of the ways in which music was taught, um, kind of comes out of the Italian tradition, uh, particularly out of Naples, Naples Neapolitan Conservatoires, which is where Fedele Fenaroli taught and um, presumably taught his um, uh, partimento exercises and so on there. The thing that's hard to understand today is very much like jazz, it was an oral tradition. Your master, they didn't have records to study back then, but your master would play, eh, here's, here's how to do this, this bass line, and then you'd repeat it by ear and you'd learn that way. So um, apparently one thing that makes the, the scholarship a bit difficult is the fact that there aren't that many text sources for any of this. Um, and those that ex exist have been um, helpfully gathered together in one place by the scholar uh, Robert Gierdingen at Northwestern University, um, who's put up a website, uh, link in the description, so you can go and check this stuff out yourself. Right, okay, so that's the background. Um, for a guitarist, there's a few things that make it a little bit hard to get into. One thing is this stuff's all designed for the keyboard. So in general, with the keyboard, you know, you have, uh, you can have quite florid things in the left hand, and then, you know, 
and the, the you know uh, if you're a classically trained pianist you can do you can do florid things with both hands um, on the guitar we generally if we're playing finger style we generally do the lower part with the thumb or if you're doing hybrid style with a pick the fingers there's a limit to what the fingers can do <laughs> i'll put it that way and um a lot of the stuff in the Fenneroli uh, books aren't necessarily that well designed for guitar and i think there's some things that sound fantastic on a harpsichord when a, a really good partimento uh realizer like uh, evald de Mera or somebody does it you go like oh that sounds great but when i do certain things like repeated notes repeated bass notes and things on the guitar it doesn't sound quite so good and certainly doesn't seem to merit the difficulty of playing that stuff. So there's a lot of stuff. Um, Nicola Pignantiello, who I think is the best, the best known um, partimento guy on guitar. It's a classical guitarist, so he's playing, I think, a 19th century guitar, which I don't think those things are the easiest to play. So he mostly transposes things into open keys like A, D, G, um, because you you kind of have to do that. And he's basing his practice on what he what he's learning from uh, Italian classical guitar composers of the early 19th century, such as uh, Mauro Giuliani and um, uh, people like that, right? So um, my approach is somewhat different because the first time I heard anybody improvise Baroque music on a guitar, it was Ted Green on a Telecaster. So I'm like, oh, okay. So that, hence the Telecaster. Several people have noted the Ted Green connection. Thank you very much. I also have a Telecaster that's the same colour as his. Um, unfortunately, in no other way am I like Ted Green, who's amazing. Check him out. Um, Ted Green basically reversed or engineered all of this stuff himself by ear and, and from reading charts um, and, and has a list of rules on his website. Um, I've tended to not go down that route because um, it, the information is, is available from the guys back in the 18th century now thanks to the work of scholars like Sanguinetti and Gedingen. And plus, if I can read figured bass and get familiar with the way they thought about things, then I can actually understand charts of that era. Um, it made sense to me to go down this direction. Um, but, you know, that's not to diminish Ted Green's amazing achievement uh, to be able to do that. Um, Barry Harris kind of similarly just kind of was able to improvise in the style of Chopin, for instance, just by, you know, really loving Chopin's music and checking it out and understanding it in his own way. Um, so anyway, um, I think doing this stuff on the electric guitar particularly is, is really to do with my wanting to broaden my understanding of harmony out. I'm not really trying to be a Baroque performer. I think like, if you listen to Nicola play, for instance, that the level to which um, classical guitarists and people who are involved in that music um, and Nicola also plays lute um, it's, it's really um, that there's a lot of stuff like ornamentation phrasing stuff like that which um, is, is really the study of a lifetime to do well you know good classical musician um, so for me it's it, it, obviously it's about overlapping with the jazz thing um, and uh, really my primary focus is on things like counterpoint and the harmony rather than necessarily melodic ornamentation. So that's that's where I'm coming at it from. And playing it on an electric guitar of some kind anchors it a bit more in the other stuff that I would do. That's why I'm not always playing it on a classical guitar. That and I suck as a classical guitarist. I'm not good. Um, I'm acceptable, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, maybe not acceptable. I, I certainly wouldn't be giving any classical recitals, let me put it that way. You know, that, that's not my... I, I do it for my own pleasure and that's it. Whereas jazz is something that I would do for money. Um, so I'm seeing this as a way to enhance my uh, my knowledge of the fretboard and my knowledge of harmony and my knowledge of counterpoint, tonality, that kind of thing, form. Um, what I would say is I want to do a video about how to how to do this. Um, and we're going to start with the first exercise in the Fenneroli book and I'm going to try and convert it into something resembling guitar language so that people will be able to um, get into it. Um, I try to provide you with the tools to do that yourself um, and uh, I don't expect it to be terribly successful but um, hopefully um, hopefully it will be of interest to somebody and I think some people have been intrigued by what I've been posting. Finally I just want to say like, there's loads of resources available aside from Gerdingen's website um, there's several excellent classical improvisation channels I'm thinking uh, John Mortensen's channel is very interesting um, Eval de Mera has walkthroughs of how to go about some 
Partimenti. It's a bit more advanced. It's like getting up to book four of Fenaroli. Um, but his realizations are very inspiring. They're amazing. Uh, Michael Koch, um, who on YouTube goes by the name of En Blanc et Noir, uh, sorry, En Blanc et Noir, um, is uh, definitely worth checking out. He's an amazing improviser. His stuff is less, uh, this is how we go about doing a partimento and more about like, Oh yes, look at check out this amazing way of embellishing, you know, <laughs> six three chords or whatever. You know, um, I know he talks a little bit about you know basic stuff, but but he's a lot more advanced, I would say. Um, and then you have um, Gerding has his own channel, um, Child Composers, worth checking out. Lots of good background information and basic stuff, um, and and scholarship and interesting historical context and stuff. Um, there's um, a very good video on Partimento by Early Music Sources, made famous by Adam Neely most recently. Um, I'm just waiting for Adam Neely or maybe uh, Nare Sol or somebody like that to get into this, actually, um, because then I think it's going to blow up. Um, but most of the people who seem to be interested at the moment seem to be um, either academics or complete dweebs like me. So uh, I wonder if that's going to change soon. Um, Anyway, um, I'm going to leave off there. Um, let me know what you think. Uh, and uh, please like and subscribe, all the other stuff people always say. And um, I'll uh, see you soon.